Thank you, everyone, for uh, showing up. And my talk is Through the Eyes of a Hacker, uh, Cloud Foundry Edition. So my name is Kevin Yorton. I work for Stark & Wayne uh, Consultancy. We love Cloud Foundry. We basically set it up and maintain and work on it and support the community. We love it. So it was kind of one of the things we decided um, we should figure out a hacker, right? Does he love Cloud Foundry? You know, what, what would it look like to him? And um, if you're, you know, in the, the security world, you know about all the stuff going on, ransomwares and uh, Blue Keep and, and so forth. Uh, but we want to look at something a little bit more towards um, uh, the Cloud Foundry side. And we're not really talking too much about you know, the curious, the, the, the brilliant hackers. We're more talking, you know, the, the, the guys who want a, a quick buck or, you know, they're just in it to, you know, be bad guys. And their main means of attack is going to be stuff like phishing attacks and scripts that they get off and, you know. So we started to look at this. Okay. Red slide. Oh, by the way, um, CVEs, lots of things, lots of holes in the operating systems in components. We're not really going to be talking about that directly. Um, keep your systems updated. So round one. So, okay, our friend the hacker wants to attack something. He starts using some common tools and map whatever. Find an open port. Okay, hey, here's an interesting one. Let's curl it. Hmm. That's a weird message. One minute of Google, hey, this is Cloud Foundry. Here's the route. Okay, so what is this Cloud Foundry thing? Well, here's some great documentation. Here's a thing to log in. You need a domain name. Okay, well, I got an IP address. SSL certificate. Okay, a little bit of information leakage, maybe. But all of us developers and operators, we need SSL certificates. We need to have uh, a port, something open for people to connect to. Right, so he now knows, here are all the domain names, there's one login.system, there's system. From all the documentation he's seen, api.system.north, you know, cf.example.com, I'm gonna start poking at that, right? There's a v2 info, get some version numbers, get some other information. Now, you know, as operators, we set this up, Right? We have a firewall and a load balancer somewhere. It's going to come in. It's going to go through our Go routers and our CF. Right, this is standard. And maybe we see you know, some weird request coming in on the API port. We want to do something about that. Well, we have a VPN. We'll just change the DNS entry. You try doing it. Goes to a 10 dot something. Time's out. Right? We've stopped the tracker in his, in his uh, tracks. He can't do anything. And please, if you're maintaining a cloud foundry, please keep it up to date. So round two. Our hacker, well, he's, he's not going to give up that easily. Right? You can pass in a vhost. Right? Going through a load balancer. So he finds out, oh, this works. Just pop it into SE host. You know, nothing fancy. He can continue his attacks. So, as an operator, you know there's some stuff we can do to stop it. You can go on to your load balancer, and you can blacklist domain names and vhosts. Right? Not too sure if anyone here has done that before. If anyone here really wants to do that, but okay, we do this. We can block the hacker. Right? Uh, in HA proxy, you'd have something like silently drop request and nginx. If you're using an nginx reverse proxy, um, you can just add another server block to return 503, 403. Right? Different way to do it. If you're using F5, they have a way ELBs. So, and everyone, please remember, update your cloud boundaries. Okay, round three. Our hacker, he's up in all the coolest, latest hacking techniques, right? 
you go onto the dark web, you can do stuff like buy email and password lists, right? Adobe's been broken into, had their list stolen, XKD. Um, there's, there's hundreds of sites where their databases have been dumped, and there's a whole bunch of these emails and passwords, right? And so what's happening right now is hackers are taking these known good emails and old passwords, and they're saying, well, okay, this was from Adobe. Let's try this with eBay. Let's try this with Amazon. Let's try this, maybe they used it somewhere. All right, very common attack nowadays. And you're going, well, that's not really gonna work. Someone's throwing hundreds and hundreds of login attempts at an API, it'll get rate limited, it'll get blocked, it'll get you know, failed a ban and rack attack from Kickstarter. Except there's some tools out there on the dark web. You can rent a proxy with you know, those uh, uh, botnets. And so your requests go to this botnet and go from thousands of IP addresses. So one email and one, uh, one email and one password comes from one IP address. The next email and password comes from another IP address. Another email and password comes from another one, right? Looks like good traffic. If you try and, and tighten down um, how many login attempts from one IP address, you've just hosed any offices you have that have one router. So, the solution most of the industry is using is multi-factor authentication, right? It's actually built in to UAA. It was released last year in 2018, but it's still not very popular. Uh, the documentation for it basically doesn't exist. There's a few API calls. Um, there's some changes that be done. And there's a lot of people that don't like using it because you have to have a little app on your phone. Right, Google Authenticator is probably the one you're most familiar with. Microsoft makes one. I actually like Authy. It has a way of backing up your one-time codes to other phones. So I had it on my phone. I used uh, the Bluetooth copy to copy to my iPad. So if I left my phone downstairs and I'm logging in somewhere, right, it makes two-factor authentication more palatable, which is one of the problems. But uh, you know, people are complaining, well, it's gonna break all my pipelines, right? My pipelines log in, it can't do two-factor authentication. Uh, what the Cloud Foundry people are suggesting is you switch over to uh, you know, the client secret, client credentials. They've done that to the smoke test, which is why they will work again. Uh, that's one of the reasons why you didn't hear too much about it in uh, 2018 is they weren't pushing it because smoke tests had to be updated and you know, this is a bit different, right? Without multi-factor authentication because you're generating basically a random ID and a random password that hopefully you're storing in your pipelines, vault, or cred hub. It's not gonna be usable anywhere else. It's not reusable. So, you know, the fact it doesn't have multi-factor authentication on it isn't a big issue, right? But to turn on multi-factor authentication, is this is just one of 20, 30 different UAA commands you have to run correctly to get it turned on. And most people are doing it on separate zones and there's a whole debate on whether or not you're going to, you know, force it on everybody or not. So um, show of hands, does anybody have multi-factor authentication on any of their cloud foundries? Uh, a, as far as I know, there's only like three cloud foundries in the world that has successfully turned it on. It's something that we kind of need to work on. Uh, by the way, everyone, please remember to update your cloud foundries. Okay, so none of us are using multi-factor authentication. Probably very few of us have gotten our login APIs um, blocked off on the internet, you know, on VPN only or anything like that. So, you know, our company has a designer. The company's paying for his Adobe suite. All right, he's logged into Cloud Foundry once or twice. He's logged into Adobe. Adobe gets hacked. Password list taken out. He changes his Adobe password like a good person. Forgets all about his other credentials. Password list comes. Our little hacker guy does his password attack, he's in. He's found someone's credentials. So the most common first attack 
is going to be just, hey, push up a Bitcoin miner. Easy money, right? No problem. There's four or five of them you know, already on Docker Hub for things that are more CPU friendly. And this has been around for a long time. This is a slide from 2014's uh, Pivotal talking about their Pivotal web services and just how much problems they're having with Bitcoin miners. Right? You get a free 21 day trial, people sign up, upload Bitcoin miners you know, for like a couple cents and it's free for them. And if you've got you know, stolen credit cards or whatever, you can you know, push it up. Amazon has this problem, Engineer had this problem, a whole bunch of hosting providers, you know, Bitcoin miners. But not too big of a problem for us because we're monitoring our Cloud Foundry, right? We have you know, Prometheus installed and a dashboard. We should be watching for cells that are at 100% or 90% constantly. Because even if it's not a Bitcoin miner, right, you don't, maybe it's a bad Java app that's gone crazy or something. So if someone's pushing up Bitcoin miners, hopefully we'll see it, we'll be able to clean it up, right? And if it's not a Bitcoin miner, then you'll just talk to the app developer and say, uh, 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 come on. So, and uh, just a quick note, this is 100% CPU time. If it was something like a build pack, it would be more spiky because of disk IO. So you can do stuff like set up monitors that say, hey, if something's 100% for two minutes, alert me. Right? It's, it's not too difficult. Um, and everyone, please remember to update your cloud foundries. So um, our hacker, he's not into Bitcoin. He's a little bit more clever. There is some fantastic documentation, some great courses, the Pivotal website, the training, all of these conference talks. He's gonna start poking around. He has a login, he's gonna do this org thing and space thing and, hey, look at these databases hooked up. ENV, I've got the creds, right? I can now start downloading the app databases, right? You, you have a little, you know, uh, messaging app or you know maybe your payroll app on Cloud Foundry and they download the app and that app's gonna have probably an authentication table with emails in it. He's now got a fresh list of emails that's probably quite relevant for your Cloud Foundry and depending on the age of the authentication library maybe they're not hashed very well, maybe they're not salted, maybe your developer skipped every single security course and is storing the passwords plain text. I mean, that, that still happens today. So he gets in, he grabs one of these passwords lists, he throws it against UAA again. Maybe he gets a few more logins, maybe he gets another login with more databases and the cycle repeats. And also, if you have a list of emails and passwords that work on a site, you can sell it again, right? There is a dark web where you take these lists of hacked sites, you test them against another one, don't do anything, just see which ones log in, and those lists of authenticated ones are worth more money, right? Uh, and the cycle repeats, because those ones, no one knows they've been hacked, no one's gonna change their password, right? How many, how many times do you guys go to your site and say, well, I don't know if I've been hacked, but I'm gonna change my password anyway, right? Doesn't happen. So this cycle can repeat and repeat, and repeat. And please, everyone, please remember to update your Cloud Foundry. So, we got a hacker that's uh, pretty clever. And we're gonna go a little bit further, right? He's been studying up on Cloud Foundry a little bit. You know, we're going for someone who's not quite the, you know, lazy guy. It's between Game of Thrones seasons, it's Friday night, he doesn't know where to go. So he's reading up application security groups, right? He starts looking into this, here's an IP range. This is how Cloud Foundry says all of these services are whitelisted. That IP range is gonna have Postgres, Redis, you know, MongoDB, all these things that us as operators stand up for our users and our data services team. And, you know, I don't think they're all gonna be up to date, 
right? That's, that's one of the problems that our industry has is we stand something up, it works, patches come out, and we like schedule it for next month. While there's a hacker that gets onto your uh, Cloud Foundry, well, he's now got a way of figuring out where those databases are. He can push code up to your containers. He can SSH in and well, he can basically do anything. He's inside your network. Give me a second, I need to get a glass of water. So, so yeah, you, got, you have this nice range of IPs and you can go through and, I mean, these are limited to the orgs and spaces, but this is information. There's not much we can do because if we start, you know, locking it down, well, then our developers have problems, right? They push an app and they're like saying, hey, I need a new security group added for this database. So there's kind of this, this conundrum we have. Okay. And by the way, everyone, please remember, update your Cloud Foundry. So this talk was going to be about, you know, CVEs and network layouts and a whole bunch of other things. And when Michael and I started looking at this, we were like, okay, do we test this on Diego? Do we look at what Warden has for it? Here's this Irene stuff coming out in Istio. Well, we're kind of looking at, well, if we're, if we're doing a deep dive into network architectures and VLANs and stuff, that's changing day by day by day. And this came out in July. So Sophos did a little test. They set up 10 honeypot Windows machines with RDP turned on, remote desktop protocol. And they just left them, seeing what happened. Within one minute, the first one was found, or sorry, within two minutes, the first one was found. Within 15 hours, all 10 of these honeypots were found. People were poking at them, trying logins and stuff. And you guys are going, you know, well, RDP, that's, that's a dumpster fire. I can understand that, right? Uh, but they're looking. First day, couple hits. Next day, more and more and more and more. And this is going up and up and up and up. And, you know, again, it's no surprise. Everyone here has heard of uh, Blue Keep, right? Windows has got some huge holes in it. Microsoft actually went and released a patch for XP. Blue Keep is so bad, right? So this shouldn't be surprising. Except this report came out one week before Blue Keep was announced. This isn't people looking for RDP because there was a hole in it. This is people who are looking for something they could throw passwords at. This went up exponentially right after Bluekeep came out because you didn't need credentials anymore. So what we're looking at is, you know, Windows Server, no known vulnerabilities, hackers just poking at it, just throwing passwords at it, you know, dictionaries, attacks, and, and things like that. So the hackers are making these lists, they're checking them twice, giving them to their friends, their friends are checking them, and they went from you know, 100 pings per day to 100,000, and then to millions, right? I mean, it's almost a denial of service how many people are trying to log in. And any of you who have you know, booted up an Apache or an Nginx server to run maybe a little blog site or something, if you look into your access host, you see those you know, config.php and index.php, right? People are just looking for ports that are open and throwing whatever they can at it and say, well, is this vulnerability, is there PHP installed? Is there a Java app installed? And just hitting and hitting and hitting it. So we're kind of in this, this balance. We have our end users, we have our operators, we have the security team. Security team wants us to lock everything down, right? No access to anyone, really secure. Our developers want Everything open. I want to be able to do what I want when I need it. I don't want to create tickets for this. Operators are, I want to make sure this stuff stays up. I want to make sure we have the resources. 
it's kind of a continuing battle. And you know, that, that's kind of the, the world we're living in right now. So to get back to the passwords, in 2011, when the first leaked databases came out, a study took two of them and tried to find matching emails and then started looking at which ones had matching passwords, right? The Gawker database and the rootkit.com database. And they found of the users that overlapped, 76% uh, used the same password between two sites. And some others had you know, variations of one or two characters. A couple years later, another study was done. This one was a survey to people basically saying, hey, do you use the same password on multiple sites? Right? And the obvious answer is yes. Yes, 55% uh, said we use the same password. And that is kind of a problem. So, you know, I'm, I'm kind of bringing this up because when we're looking at security, right, first thing we want to focus on is, you know, network layouts and uh, CVEs and whatnot. And we were kind of thrown aback when we were looking at this, just at how big, you know, this problem was. Uh, there's a website you probably know about. If you haven't, go there, put your name in. Right? Have you been owned? See if your name is on the site that you know, maybe you logged into 10 years ago and forgot about. All right. As of yesterday, right, there's 400 websites, 8 billion accounts that have names and passwords that have been leaked. And I'm unfortunately guilty. And you know, maybe you're thinking, OK, well, you know, if they get my name and password from my photo site, that's my personal password. They're not going to get my Cloud Foundry one. Right? But at the same time, my work email, you know, I sign up to LinkedIn. I sign up to work-related stuff. And you, know, you kind of have to start thinking your work email, your personal email, all these emails, you're on multiple sites, especially you know, if you're, I don't know how many of you have a sandbox and a dev and a prod, how many of you are using the same password for them? Right. So uh, we, we kind of have to rethink how we're doing passwords. Uh, the National Institute of Standards and Technology actually reversed some recommendations they had on passwords. Right? They used to have the recommendation to have symbols and uppercase and lowercase and right now that made passwords that were hard for us to remember very easy for machines to remember or to go through, right? And we would end up writing it down, password managers, which we all should be using, were used. Now the, the common recommendation is just long passphrases, right? Instead of cloud cow, which I think all of us know from our operator days, should be something like security hates cloud cow, right? Not much different, it's much longer. So they're also saying things like, you know, make sure if you have a password field, it accepts at least 64 character long passwords. When, when I was in university, uh, we had a, a basically a boy genius who, um, I think he, he got into university when he was 14 and he was going for his master's of mathematics. And his password was pi to 40 digits, right? And he was, you know, didn't mind telling people because how many people knew pi to 40 digits? He had them memorized. And so he's logging in. And one day he's like logging in and he's typing it in and he's like messes up the tenth digit. He's like, ah, who cares? Enter. He's logged in. Hold on a second. He typed in nine correct digits of his password and he was logged in. The Unix systems, SunOS at the time, used crypt, which had an eight character password limit. Anything past eight characters ignored. So his, pa his password was the first eight digits of pi. So, so when we're talking about some of these attacks, it's not actually our cloud foundries that we should really be worried about. It's the security of all the other sites on the internet that can actually get us into a lot of trouble. Right? So 
I'm going to go back to what I was talking to about before with, with multi-factor authentication and with trying to make some uh, rules to block who can access your API. Because we're not doing that right now. It's very complicated. It's not documented. I think we need to actually take a step back and, and make an effort to try and limit these password attacks. That we should try and get multi-factor authentication. I'm actually working on a blog post and some better documentation. Uh, unfortunately, it's actually a lot more complicated than I expected, and I didn't have it ready in time for this talk. Um, but we're trying to get it so that you can basically type in a few commands, turn on multi-factor authentication, at least for some zones, on all your Cloud Foundries you know, this week. So that when you stand up a Cloud Foundry, you have it on by default day one. And if you are thinking, well, I don't want to put my API behind a firewall, right? it's very inconvenient. If your developers are using pipelines to deploy, right? you push your app to GitHub or Bitbucket or whatever, pipelines trigger, then as long as your concourse workers or Jenkins or Travis CI is in the VPN, right? it uses client secrets, it can push it, then all the stuff like the CF scale you can do maybe from a jump box or do it from the VPN. And it won't be a big disruption to your users, right? If you're so now we've been mostly talking about passwords. I'm kind of trying to hammer in just how bad uh, it actually is. How many of the hackers, I mean, it, You've got the real amazing hackers who will go in with a debugger and try and single step through code for buffer overflows. They'll do uh, white box attacks, fuzzing of the APIs, right? And they're actually pretty good. Uh, now, I've been beating up on Cloud Foundry, but I've actually included Cloud Foundry and Kubernetes because, you know, everyone in here, there's some Kubernetes in your Cloud Foundry now, soon, right? Um, there are quite a bit of overlap. Um, I'm not focusing on Kubernetes because the story for logging in and maintaining is still kind of in flux, right? Whether you're using cube control or something else uh, to log in. Cloud Foundry, very mature. The API is fantastic. The, the CLI is great. Um, and it actually, ironically, is great for developers, which means it's also great for hackers. So uh, if you weren't aware, um, just a few weeks ago, denial of service attack against Kubernetes, right? The Go language had a few weaknesses in their HTTP, and you could send uh, a whole bunch of requests that could denial of service your Kubernetes. Uh, we use Go in like our Go routers. Um, I didn't find any reference to this affecting Cloud Foundry, but there's a good chance that uh, we're using the same stuff. And with Istio and Irene and all of that coming in, uh, this would be affecting us. Now, this is not you know, getting on to the box style. This is denial of service. So when we're looking at our security, um, it's kind of a holistic approach. It's, it's very easy to focus on a lot of the technical details. But password reuse and weak passwords is actually the biggest problem because that's the easiest one. You don't need any technical skills, right? You use Nmap, find a couple IP addresses. You can use a Bash script or PowerShell or Ruby or Python just to call the CF CLI with, you know, admin AAAA, admin AAAB, admin AAAC. And if there's no rate limiting, if there's no um, Cloudflare or something like that in your stack to stop it, they can just run that for a couple days, try and brute force it. If uh, they're lucky, they buy the right password list, right, they come in. Phishing is the one that I didn't really talk about. We all know what it is. You get an email that says, hey, you have to log into your Cloud Foundry to you know, win a prize. <laughs> and some people will put their name and password in. Nobody in this room, of course, 
because using Cloud Foundry is a prize of its own. So, um, and then CVEs. So, a couple pink slides popped up during my presentation. I didn't really say too much about them. Right. Um, one thing you might have noticed is they were all specifically for UAA. I chose a couple of the recent ones that affected UAA only. All right. And if you had a clever hacker, then you could kind of chain them together. Right? There's one that we were doing something silly. If there was no um, domain name, you know, like admin or something like that, it would attach at unknown.org, which someone actually owns. And so you could send reset emails and other stuff to this domain that someone else owns. Now, you know, best case, they ignore it. Maybe a mail filter you know, bounces it back because there's no user. You, know, you don't know what happens to it. But there's another one that uh, allows you to do some click jacking uh, or grab a refresh token instead of the authorization token. There's a whole bunch of these little CVEs that might help you get a name and password or a login. Um, Multi-factor authentication had a big hole a few months ago where you could brute force the multi-factor authentication. It didn't actually stop you from trying multiple times. So even with multi-factor authentication turned on, you could try a million times per second. Kind of negated its advantage. It's been fixed, by the way, it's been fixed. But okay, so if you can get a name and password and you can brute force your multi-factor authentication, then you can get in. And oh, there was a slight hole where you could craft something to elevate your privileges with UAA. Oh, oh, and by the way, if you could get in and you had a valid name and password up until last month, um, you could then change your password, pass in a specially crafted password that would do a buffer overflow on Postgres and run code on your Postgres instance, which is outside of your Cloud Foundry, or uh, sorry, inside of your you know, Cloud Foundry. So yeah, please keep your Cloud Foundries up to date, please. So um, when we're working on this talk, you know, we were hoping to come up with some really clever attack where we're breaking into garden and, you know, we uploaded. It, it turns out um, the new stem cells are based on Bionic. You can just boot up a Bionic instance, uh, app git, whatever you want, take all those files, stick it into a bundle and CF push it. So we had you know, TCP dump and Nmap all running inside the container and we were poking around. And the more research we did, the more we realized that these attacks, you know, while cute and maybe entertaining, aren't the ones that you really have to worry about. So as long as you're keeping your systems patched and you turn on MFA and you limit your API and login, you're actually going to be getting rid of a lot of the biggest problems you're going to run into. I mean, it's, it's, this is the operator track. We're talking Cloud Foundry. Um, we could be talking for hours and hours if you want to talk about exploits in node packages or build packs. We have Ruby, we have Python, we have all these languages that have their own security nightmare. And we're just focusing right now on Cloud Foundry. So if even one of you leaves here and says, you know, Maybe I'm going to look into this multi-factor authentication, and maybe maybe I'm going to see if I can, you know, maybe see if I can talk to the team about tightening that API endpoint. I think that's a huge win for our community, especially if in doing that we learn a little bit more on how to make this maybe in the future like a checkbox when you install it. So. Thank you. Any anything you guys want to uh, talk about? It's uh... yes. So we talked about CVEs. Uh, uh, what about uh, resource exhaustion? I mean, if we are on, uh, in a system, or even if we are outside of the system, uh, 
Uh, ah, I'll give you, I'll give you this. I was going to repeat the question, but it's uh, <laughs> yeah. He he's asking about uh, resources. Shall, shall I repeat the question? Yes, please, please. Okay, so uh, we talked about CVEs and uh, how a hacker can become aware of data. However, um, what, what is your, your opinion about uh, resource exhaustion? Meaning, for example, overloading Go router, even if you are outside of the system. So, no, I don't. No. Yeah, um, denial of service attacks are a problem. Um, you know, the easy solution that that people would be pointing to now is things like you know having Cloudflare in front of it. Um, there is not, I'm not too sure what we can do right now. Um, scaling is hard. Cloud Foundry makes it easier, but uh, I remember on Amazon days, um, you had to actually submit a form to Amazon if you were expecting a spike in traffic so they could pre-warm your elastic load balancer because the elastic load balancers have slow response times. So we had customers who had elastic load balancers. They were going to be on the Oprah show or something, and they're telling us, hey, we're going to have a huge spike in traffic at this time. Can you make sure our site goes up? And then we go to Amazon, and they say, well, you have to fill out this paperwork to tell us when, and we'll get some engineers to maybe boost. You know, um, And that's kind of a problem that probably is only going to be fixed with a little bit of planning and communication. Right? If you are running a Cloud Foundry and everything looks good, you're getting you know, a million requests an hour for an app, and they don't tell you that they're going to be on The Tonight Show or Oprah or you know, Stranger Things, you're going to run into problems. And there's not too much you can do about that because, um, well, there's probably going to be a talk that's going to tell you how to solve it. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I recently re read an article about uh, passwordless login using the FIDO2 approach. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, a topic that, that the community deals with? So UAA does mention things like the FIDO2 and YubiKey. There's a couple companies out there that are working on it. Um, Steve Gibson is working on the Squirrel protocol, which is another passwordless login. Um, you can use LDAP and other things with UAA. So um, I personally don't know if I want to move to a passwordless world. I do know I want to move to a two or three factor, right? In, in data centers, you have three factors. What you have, what you know, what you are. What you have is your swipe card or your USB stick. Um, what you know is your pin code or password, and what you are is your you know, hand print or retinal scan. Right? Uh, the big joke that's going around is a whole bunch of Android phones to try and catch up with Touch ID shipped their fingerprint sensors in debug mode, which meant every single photo of your fingerprint was actually stored on device for debugging purposes. So if someone took your phone, all your fingerprints were there. And so the joke was, OK, if that happens, just change your fingerprints. Right? You can't do that. So um, it has to be something like you said, a YubiKey, but if you lose that, it, it has to be kind of a mix. I personally would recommend you have a two or three factor solution. And that's why I'm like begging everyone here to look into multi-factor authentication to see if you can even play with it in your environment and get the documentation improved and look at the, uh, actually I can show you for one second. Uh, it's right here somewhere. Uh, here is the API docs for it. And well, uh, MFI providers and there is, you know, available include Google Authenticator, uh, but there are a few documents for other types. I don't know what state they're in. I'm just trying to get this one working. Okay. So I will say thank you to everybody.